That's true. Who tries to be on the up and up? I'll take it a little lower. Yeah, it's better. Check out the gas money. Put it in the mailbox over here. We'll call it a day. Now we've made it. But yeah, John's got his schemes for sure. For sure. Hello, everyone. 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 Hello, I'm very excited about this because feature flags are just a thing that I've always wanted to know more about and actually implement in my own software. And luckily, we have an expert. <laughs> Scott, take it away. I don't know if I call myself an expert, but uh, thank you everyone for coming. Sorry if you were interested in the first date. I'm disappointed when I had came down with what might have been the food. I was the first one. I was kind of happy. <laughs> 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 Uh, before I really get started, let me uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, as, as George said, my name is Scott. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Officially, I'm a front-end web developer at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's a federal government agency headquartered in Washington, D.C. But we are lucky enough to have a remote first design and development team across the country. Seeing as it is a government agency, they can be a little bit particular about things, so I need a little Disclaimer to include for you here. I'm giving this presentation in my personal capacity. Nothing that I say is representative of the opinion of the Bureau or the federal government. Yada, yada, yada. All right, back to the intro. Uh, I said I'm nominally a front end developer, but uh, I've always disliked JavaScript, um, by which I mean I'm not really very good at it. So I started getting more into Python lately. Um, Python, I think, is a pretty cool, elegant language. I don't know if Python sucks. Super jazz about it. Um, and so the examples in this talk will be Python based, but hopefully the concepts will uh, be applicable to whatever language you use. Um, I got into Python also because I wanted to be able to wanted to be able to develop new features for our website uh, with the CMS integration from start to finish. So we use the Wagtail CMS, which is built on the Django framework, and I've also started contributing to the Wagtail project itself. As far as uh, some personal interests go, if you care at all about that, here are some of the off-topic channels in the Rockdev Slack you might find me in regularly. That'll give you a, a sense of some things I'm into. But anyway, um, I signed up to give this talk after a discussion in the Rockdev Slack group about deploying and releasing. It's been long enough in my memory is fuzzy enough that I don't remember the discussion completely, but I think what happened was I interjected with some advocacy of using feature flags, and George said, hey, maybe you should do a talk on it. So, yeah. yeah, don't say anything in the Slack channel or you'll be giving a talk. He's definitely high. I imagine some of you are familiar with the concept, but some of you may not be, so I'll, I'll briefly introduce what a feature flag is. Feature flags are, in and of themselves, features of a website or application can be used to automatically toggle code on or off under a variety of conditions. For example, uh, time-based conditions or date-based conditions, the server environment that you might be using, the type of user who's accessing the site at the time, uh, and many others. And those are, those are examples of how you might have them toggled automatically, but perhaps more commonly, they're simply used by manually flipping them on and off by someone hitting a button in an uh, in admin interface. Uh, this pithy little bit of pseudocode kind of demonstrates the basic principle in the most simple example. At a certain point in your code, you check the state of the feature flag. If it is on or if it you know, evaluates to true or truthy, you do a certain thing. Otherwise, you don't do that thing, or you do something else. You know. Why might you want to use them? Uh, feature flags can be used for many different purposes, uh, but I'll give a few examples. Testing is a big one. You can use them to restrict new code to internal users or internal servers. You can also use them as part of an A-B testing setup, serving one version of the code to a portion of your audience and uh, the regular version to the rest of the people to see which performs better. Uh, you might use them as an easy way to turn off, uh, turn on or off a temporary notification, something like a service interruption notice or um, a client maintenance banner. 
And perhaps many of you are already familiar with feature flags from being on the user end of them. Uh, like when Facebook or Twitter is rolling out a feature gradually. So they say, hey, I got this new thing, but I don't have it yet. So, um, but you, or also you may opt into them. Like uh, GitHub does a lot of feature previews. So you can say, hey, let me try this new feature that you're beta testing. But in my opinion, the biggest reason to use them is the separation of concerns. We had a conversation uh, like this. Business person. We need to go live at exactly 12 noon because we think we're important enough to have a press embargo. And as soon as we lift it, everyone will rush to publish their stories. Well, we see you can't exactly guarantee that because we have this deployment pipeline and uh, we, we do code for this and it'll take about like 20 to 30 minutes, but you know, in that range. Well, you better figure it out. Uh, I guess we can make the change live on our server. Um, it's not a real fun conversation to have. So going back to that conversation that prompted this talk, uh, the big win the feature flags can give you is separating releases from code deployments. Setting up a new release behind a feature flag can make enabling code as easy for developers developers, as it is for content editors to publish a new draft from the CMS. That scary conversation can now result in, okay, sure, we'll just push up the code a day ahead of time, we'll send it to the stakeholder to review it on an internal server, and then when it's ready, we'll push the button to make it go live in production at the correct time. If you're a fan of continuous delivery, uh, feature flags are one of the primary enablers of that concept being that anytime something is merged into production or into your master branch, it gets deployed and new code is not delivered to, well, that's the delivery part. New code is not served to your users until uh, some setting of toggle is turned on to do that. And aside from eliminating the stress of trying to precisely time a deployment, they can also reduce the stress level for releasing new code to the full scale of your user base if you do that type of gradual rollout thing that is like Facebook and Twitter famous for. Describing it in the abstract is great, but if like me, if you're like me, you may need to see something in action for it to sink in. So I will uh, try to risk uh, doing a quick live demo for a simple example. Um, again, you may not be familiar with Python and Django, but hopefully the concepts will, will mostly make sense for you. So what we have here, this is the uh, demo site for the Wagtail CMS that I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, built on the Django framework, Python-based framework for making websites and web apps. It's a simple little marketing site for a theoretical bakery. Uh, you can view the breads that it offers, what locations it has, blog, typical small business marketing site type stuff. Let's take a quick look at the CMS admin behind the scenes. This is the basic Wagtail admin. Uh, as far as what comes stock with it, all the pages are editable by browsing through this page explorer menu, which goes down through the, the hierarchy, the tree of the site. There are image and document libraries. And, and then finally, the settings menu, where you can do all kinds of configuration. There are some other items you can see in this uh, admin interface that are custom to this demo, but built on frameworks that Wagtail provides. In the bread categories and bakery miscellaneous areas, there's some metadata configuration you can do, reasonable text snippets and things like that that you can, you can pull in on other pages in a place to create some simple forms. So Wagtail is very customizable, but offers a lot of tools out of the box to help you do exactly what you want. Anyway, let's say this bakery has a desire to show here on the home page a, uh, let's, let's say a temporary message about upcoming holiday hours. I'm going to make a nice big banner here across the top. 
if we go to edit the home page, we can see that the way this is set up in different fields, and unfortunately the some of the nuances of the interface are being lost on the projector here, but there, there are different fields here, and there's nothing that would really work for you to just dump some code in for a banner like that. But if we, as we might want to use this sort of thing regularly in the future, this is a good candidate for putting something behind the feature flag. So here's how we can do it. Terminal, here's the code editor. Okay, so first we are going to Window management may be the hardest part of one thing. First, we're going to install the Python packages that Wagtail will use to create these flags. So in, in Django, you have this concept of a requirements file, or Python, uh, actually. And in here, we'll add these requirements, Django flags, and Wagtail flags, which extends Django flags with the Wagtail interface. Oh, I misspelled flags. Thank okay. you. Not follows. So we'll, this is like any other uh, sort of dependency list. You set these in here. I don't really care what the versions are because I know they already work. Um, I today. All right, get into my virtual environment here, and I will install those requirements using install. Okay, successfully installed our two new requirements here. And now we need to, in Django, we need to add them to the list of installed applications in its settings file. Django has in its uh, this concept of settings file where you store lots of pertinent information. Uh, base will apply to any environment. We see some others for dev and production and that sort of thing. But we want to install this in all environments. So we go to the installed apps list. We have a couple of new things here. Flags is the proper app name for Django flags. And then right to the flags. Save that. So those are now installed uh, in a way. Uh, we also do want to add a quick line of middleware here. Flags on the middle. Conditions. Uh, clearly, just typing this off my speaker notes, <laughs> not remembering this. Remember. All right, we'll save that, and then we also need to do another common Django thing, which is to run some migrations to add the necessary bits uh, for the feature flags to the database. So that's manage.py <coughs> migrate. It'll run the basic migrations that are already included with the Django Flags app. There we go. Okay, now back in the code. Actually back in the browser. That's that's the installation is done. Um, and if we and if we go to that, we stay in admin here and refresh this. Right? Refresh. If you look in the settings menu we can see there's a new entry for flags. Django flags and Wagtail flags has added this. But as you can see, no flags have yet been defined. So we'll go back to the code. And uh, the flags are initially defined also in the settings file. So we have a couple new lines here. We have a new flags uh, dictionary. And we'll create our first key for that. We'll call it holiday hours banner. And we're going to make that an empty empty list for now. We're not going to give it any conditions to start. Ah, 
Valencia. Colon was a place. So the flag is defined. We return again to the flags page and refresh that. We can see that it's now uh, registering here, but it is never enabled. We're going to need something to do with that flag, too. So let's uh, come back to the code here and open our home page template. To be able to check this, temp this flag in the Django template, we need to load a new Django template tags module, again, provided by Django flags. And that's called feature flags. And then down here, inside the content block, We're going to evaluate, we're going to get the state of that flag and assign it to a local template variable. So we use the flag enable um, flag enabled tag, all in every banner, and we'll use as to cast to, to, get, to set that as a template variable. Lowercase. This is not highlighting correctly, so highlighting. With that flag, and, uh, now with that variable set, we can check that variable. If all the average banner, we can put in some markup. Uh, I'll just do some inline styling here. Not great practice, but you know, for our purposes, it's fine. We need to put padding and the background color. And then inside we will say holiday hours. We'll call it 12 to 6. Close the div. And the if. Save that. Turn to the browser. And Again, it's, the flag is still not enabled, so nothing is showing it yet. But if we go here and uh, is this oh, I'm guessing they added, they added a condition. Okay. Tell me the interface here, but there's a drop down menu for different types of conditions that are possible. And um, the simplest one you can do is to just use a Boolean and set it to true. That means it will always be an input. Save that condition. It's enabled when Boolean is true. You know what? This is. I think I installed the wrong version here, and I can fix this by. Loading my other
All right, this is what I was expecting to see. Um, Okay, so now in the current version of YTF Flags, what you see here is you just have a button. You can enable this for all requests. This is a little shortcut to that building condition, make it a little bit nicer user interface. So if we were to just click this button to enable it for all requests, we would see. Um, and we would see on that page. There's an Woo! All right. So that's great. That's, that is the most simple way to do it, just by toggling on and off a, uh, a flat, uh, a, with a button like that. Um, but how else could we set up this flag? We can set it up as one of the other conditions that you saw on the list there. Uh, let's say we wanted the flag to automatically turn off at the end of the day on the holiday, so that you don't have to log in on a holiday and do your start. You can set up the before date condition to do this. So I'll, I'll unenable it for all requests, and I'll add a condition. And, and first, let me show you that. Now it's gone away. Now I can add a condition before date. And we can say if it's before uh, today's, uh, tomorrow, let's say it's before tomorrow's date of the 5th. And uh, to do a stupid. Is that going to be UTC? Yeah, right, it's okay. like, yeah. yeah. I think that's the format. Um, so the before tomorrow at noon Zulu, flag it back. And if we set this to yesterday, and save it again, it's gone. So this would, you know, pending any caching issues you might have, this could help, you know, have that automatically be taken down at the top. At you can also do a path-based condition. Let's say we, we set this up on the home page template, but let's say we wanted to show it on both the home page template, uh, the home page and the contact us page, but no other pages. To do that, we could set this up on, uh, we could take this code, remove it from here, put it on our base template, right before that content block. And um, again, we need to load that feature flags tag library. So now it's on the base template. It's no longer on the home page template. And if we um, turn to the browser, we need this condition. Nothing is showing, um, but if we were to add path conditions, path matches, this is a regex matching thing. So we want to start and end with a slash to get the home page, and we want to add another one to the contact page. that. Okay, so now you can see the help text here saying all your banner is enabled when any of these conditions is met. You can also make conditions required and have to do specific conditions and others, but for now it's either one of these paths that will be enabled. So we reload the home page, there it is. <coughs> now it's here on the contact page as well, and not on any other. All right, so that's uh, a simple example. Um, go back to my slides here. That's, that's the end of the demo. Sorry, the painful part is over. <laughs> that was a cute example, but um, it's just, it's an incredibly simple site running in dev mode on a localhost server. And in fact, it maybe wasn't even a great example because if the CMS had been set up this way, you could have a field in which a non technical editor could drop their holiday hours notice in. Maybe a checkbox to turn it on. Maybe a field to set an expiration date for that. Um, then they could do this with the flags too, but they, if, if it was in the CMS, they could change the hours. 
and no developer involvement would be needed. But in the real world, on a large website with thousands of pages, many internal stakeholders, a potential audience of the entire United States population, and maybe some statutory requirements for what has to go on the website and when, it's not always as easy. Uh, so let's revisit that conversation for a moment. I wasn't literally quoting anything here, obviously, but I'm certain I've been the pink speaker in this situation on more than one occasion prior to us implementing a robust feature flag solution. Here's a very poor picture of our deployment, staging deployment pipeline. It averages about 16 minutes, factoring out the outliers. And once this is run, we can deploy the artifact that it generates to production also, uh, which takes on an average another 12 minutes. So to push out a critical hotfix for a bug in production could take almost half an hour after doing the development work to fix the bug and getting that merged. Yes, we have some work to do in the ops department, uh, but this is real life, and I'm sure many of you have similar situations. Hotfixes may still take us this long, but at least now when we know in advance that someone wants something to go live at a specific time, intentionally, and it requires a code change, not just a CMS content update, we can use feature flags to time that precision. Additionally, having the ability to turn a flag off instantaneously lets you effortlessly roll back if you turn on a flag in production and something unexpectedly breaks. If you had to do another deployment to roll back, that's another 25 minutes of a broken site. Turning it back off by the flag gives you some breathing room to debug it and try again. Uh, but now, current situation we're in, but thankfully for regular releases, as long as our stakeholder gives us more than a few hours of notice, we can make the necessary code changes, hide them behind the feature flag, deploy them to many and all environments, turn the feature flag on in the staging environment for their review, make any changes necessary after that review, deploy those, and then turn the flag on to release instantaneously by simply toggling, toggling the switch in the production a more fuzzy 10 minute window for when the deployment will complete in the chain of work. Do you then, after the fact, clean out the feature flag after X1 time? I will definitely be getting to that topic. Okay. Uh, I know the focus of this talk is supposed to be on, or was supposed to be on separating releases from deployments, but I can't help show a few more examples of fun ways that we've used flags. I touched on a couple of these earlier, but I want to revisit them and elaborate some more on how we've done that. By the way, we develop in the open by default, so you can check out the details of any of these examples I'm going to show at github.com slash cfpb, and uh, this stuff is all in the cfgov refresh repository. It's probably going to be at the top because it's updated every day. Beta testing. We have a beta subdomain at beta.consumerfinance.gov whose database updates nightly from production. Beta is public so that we can test things on our personal devices or sometimes show them to external stakeholders uh, so we can't give our devices or our ex you know, external people access to our internal servers for testing, so we need something public to do that from time to time. And in order to be able to deploy the same application code to both beta and production, we can put features for testing behind a flag with condition environment is not production, and they will show up on beta and every other non-production environment. This helps us merge frequently to master, uh, count on master being always deployable, and not have to maintain long-running branches that are environment-specific. Also, we use a flag to conditionally show a notice that you're on the beta site. If, that, you know, if you land on that site, and you ought to be aware of that, if the environment is beta. So, uh, that flag is configured to have a permanent, always-on condition when the environment is beta. And so in this case, we have no need to ever touch this flag in the admin interface. It's just always on. In the HTML, we then check to see if uh, the beta notice flag is enabled. This code looks a little different because it's Jinja templates on our site. And if so, we output the market for that banner. Resulting in this nice um, uh, 
we are to see yellow band on the top of the screen saying this beta says we're in progress. Another thing we've used it for, as suggested earlier, is A-B testing. I think this is a particularly clever use of feature flag, if I do say so myself. Uh, our analytics and user research team uses the Google Optimize tool to run A-B test experiments. This, and this relies on loading external JavaScript from Google servers that changes or replaces parts of the page for some portion of the visitors and checks how that compares against the visitors who receive the original. And in this case, we use a flag to avoid having to load all of that optimized JavaScript unless we know we're running a test on that specific page. So in our settings.py file, again, we define a flag uh, called AD testing. And here we have no default condition, like the previous example. And then in our page template, we wrap all of that JavaScript that Optimize needs uh, in a check of that flag. So if AB testing is enabled, only then do we output all that stuff that calls for the Google JavaScript. And then finally, in the Wagtail admin, uh, we use the path condition to only enable that flag for uh, specific page or pages that we know we're running A-B tests on at that time. This is another interesting one. It's, a, it's in another environment-based condition, um, but the thing worth noting here is that you can do much more with flags than just making new something new visible to an end user. We set up a ping Google on publish flag with condition of environment is production, environment is production, and then we check that in a bit of Python code that runs whenever a page is published, so that if a page is published on the production site, we ask Google to recrawl it, but if it's published on beta, staging, localhost, or whatever else, that request is not sent to it. So it's not all about templates and showing stuff on templates. All right, <clears throat> so we talked a lot about, a bit, a lot about different uses talk about the life cycle of them and how you manage them over the course of that. There are sort of three categories of flags that I envision in my mind as I sort of came to even developing this talk. Uh, and different categories will require, will require different approaches for handling them over your life. There are recurring short-term flags, things like the maintenance or technical difficulty notices, sale banners, A-B testing, etc. Then you have persistent long-running flags, probably based on environment or user group, like the, uh, the beta banner or the ping that publish. And then there are single-use flags, uh, which are probably the most common scenario, as, as discussed earlier, where you want to just release something new to everyone at a specific time. Each of these requires different management approaches. But the first piece of advice that I would have would be to actually categorize them in your interface and organize them. This is a very tiny screenshot of the list of flags we currently have on Consumer Finance Day. There are 53 of them, and they're just sorted alphabetic. That's probably too many in the first place. But leaving that aside, wouldn't something like this, if if you can see it a little bit clearer, <laughs> be much nicer. I've right? uh, mocked up three different buckets here. One for single-use flags, one for recurring flags, and one for persistent set it and forget it. Um, you, could, you could do this with a lot more care and design attention in the 10 minutes I spend in the dev tools mocking this up, but the point is, give yourself and your users some help understanding the landscape of the flags in your system. Doing this will allow people who are managing flags to easily find the flag they're looking for and tune out the ones that they are not concerned with. Why don't we do this already? Because as I said, I just kind of had this idea while formulating this talk, and now I need to go add that to our backlog and hopefully get it prioritized. Um, if this is something that interests you, if you're a Python user, also the Django flags and Whitetail packages, and Whitetail flags packages, I should mention, are also open source uh, on GitHub. So and uh, playing with NPRs or welcome. 
but what are the risks you might have with a poorly managed feature flag? If you're creating a single use feature flag, the very act of creating that flag is inherently adding some technical debt to your code base. You're writing code that you know you'll be taking out later, or you should be taking out. Even if you're expecting it to be a persistent or recurring flag, it makes your code more complex, potentially more confusing. If it's not named or commented well, it may be difficult to come across a flag in your code and know what it's supposed to do and when it might or might not be enabled. Another potential risk is performance degradation. If you use flags with care, it's probably not a big risk. But every time you need to check a flag in the course of loading a page, it's going to cause a small hit. And particularly when using a setup like Django flags, where flag conditions are stored in the database, each check of the flag state means that more and more database queries depending on which conditions you have set. And finally, exposing those fl these flags in the user interface can make them easy to accidentally toggle on or off. If you don't have a good user flow, help text validation, you run that risk. And what exacerbates all of these risks? Lack of visibility and lack of accountability. First on visibility, uh, Caitlin Rubin is a software engineer at Optimizely, which is an experimentation platform that leverages feature flags a lot. Um, a lot of the section of the talk, but this talk was inspired by a talk I saw her give at PyCon earlier this year. She recommends that for every flag that you have, you should be able to quickly know its state, history, metrics, and expiration. State is simple. Is it on or off? History uh, could be a log of every time the flag has been toggled and did it. Maybe even you can require that they leave a comment when they do it and log those things. And um, also, does anyone need to be actively notified when the state changes? It's sort of part of the history, part of the state, is what I guess. But when it changes, should somebody be Metrics could be things like how many times has it been evaluated, when was the last time it was evaluated, what percentage of your users are seeing the code that this flag enables right now, and what numbers might you have, analytics or whatever, to, to quantify its success or failure. And then finally, expiration, when should the flag be de decommissioned, if it should be so short term. Easy access to this information will help you avoid confusion about a flag, prevent unwanted changes to it, and increase your confidence that it is working as expected. The other exacerbating factor that I mentioned was accountability. Who will be responsible for talking to the flag? Is it you, the developer, someone else on your team, a content manager in some other department? Uh, do you trust that person? Feature flag can turn the code, the activation of the code, or the visibility of that code into a business decision. If it's going to be someone other than the person coding the flag, you should be sure that you name it clearly, provide some help text in the UI to explain what enabling the flag will do. If it's a regulated environment or any other situation where there could be legal implications of some kind, again, ensure that you create that audit trail for flag toggles. And if the flag will be long-lived or have periodic state changes, who owns that over the course of its life? In the case of something like a flag for an unplanned downtime loss, if that person is unavailable, who backs them up and is able to turn the flag? If you have flags that are restricted by permissions in your CMS or your whatever admin value you have, that's a particular group. Who decides when a long-lived flag is no longer needed And if this is a single-use flag, who is responsible for the removal of that flag from the now unused code paths uh, that are unused after it's been flipped on? How do we avoid letting that tech debt in? Well, this is good advice, I think, for any type of uh, development work, regardless of whether or not it's behind a feature flag. But you should prioritize removing flags as part of the work of the feature. Some ideas for doing this uh, would be to create a ticket at the start of the work, 
for as soon as you know that the feature will need to be flagged, create the ticket for removing the flag. Plan for a clean instrument. Again, just a good general practice anyway. Uh, and another thing you could do, this is kind of like the Jedi trick that Caleb suggested, we'll just turn on the light of my brain. Create the, the pull request, or you know, your branch, to remove the flag at the same time that you create the code that adds the flag in. When else are you going to be more clear-headed about what needs to change in the code to decommission this flag than at the same time as you're creating it? Create that, store it in the draft PR, and get back to it when the time is right. And if you're not great at prioritizing debt pay down work, like myself perhaps, uh, nag yourself into it. For flags that fall into that single use category, you could have the admin display a notification to certain users if a flag has been continuously enabled or continuously evaluated to true for some period of time. These are not features that necessarily exist in any of the products I've shown, but things that I thought about that I think would be relevant. And another way to increase the visibility is to have loud and clear code comments on flag definitions and checks so that the purpose is clear when someone comes across it. You know, and people can come across code all the time for things they may not necessarily be able to see in the admin. So you kind of have to have it in both places. Uh, different types of users need to both need that information. And know when that flag can be removed, and if there's an expected timer scenario, you would expect the flag to be on. It's going to indicate that. That's about all I've got for the prepared material, but to, to quickly sum up, uh, feature flags have many possible uses, like persistent environment-based checks, long-lived recurring toggles, and single-use releases. And with the right attention to the internal user experience, maintenance, and debt pay down, they can be a tool that enables people all over your organization to get the right code out to the right users Thanks very much, and uh, happy to take questions or have any discussion. Ever use something like launch darkly? I told them I was going to ask this. Exactly. Um, no, I have not used something like launch, launch darkly. Um, the reason that I would say we haven't tried something like that or, or optimizedly is that it's difficult in our organization to even experiment with new tools, much less procure them if they have a cost. So, you know, we kind of rolled our own solution, and I've highlighted it in many ways, and I wish I would like it to be better, but um, launch directly, I can uh, up here for your curious. This is a whole um, feature, basically feature flag management um, tool for, for platform for, for your post. And, um, it seems like a pretty cool service. Uh, I admit I haven't had as much time as I wanted to, to look into it. It supports a lot of different languages. It would know, save you probably a lot of the custom coding on your website. Sure. Sure. Not much more than it looks like the wagtail admin page. Because it does. Yeah, I think they have uh, like SDKs that you can put into all of your applications. So it just kind of drops in. Yeah, and you get that magic like load statement. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But in everything. So I'm actually. Sounds like you know a bit. Do you want me to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've already covered feature yeah. flags. <laughs> I'm actually really excited that you, you did this. Uh, thank you, because we're actually evaluating a bunch of different um, feature flag as a service providers and going to start implementing that in, in our code base. Um, we looked into Launch Darkly, we looked into Feature Flow, we looked into Rollout.io, uh, a bunch of different services, all providing some level of back end management database type of stuff. Um, I think we, we ended up going with rollout.io um, in terms of we're pretty sure we're going to use them as our vendor. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, Can you describe how it, inter how it interfaces with your code? Like, Sure. Uh, so 
each of them is subtly different, um, but uh, Rollout in particular um, has sort of a, a configuration flag object um, that is uh, defined on the development side, and like whenever you define a new flag and initialize it on the client side app that's running in JavaScript, uh, it sends that config object to the server, um, so that is how new flags are notified not uh, notified in the, the back end there. Um, you actually provide the default value on the client side, so if for whatever reason it can't hit the server or um, is, is stale or you haven't defined that flag yet, it, it has that base configuration. Um, but then once you initialize it and it gets the config back, it will do any sort of toggling that needs to happen of that local config. Um, I think that's also stored in local storage for persistence, which is nice. Um, and you can receive uh, event notifications anytime somebody messes with the back end. So you can even have, like, while, while you're running your single page app, for instance, have someone toggle a flag and it could reflect in the, the user interface without even refreshing the page or anything like that. So. It sounds like in that situation, particularly the, because it has to check the state on the server, mm -hmm. it might be even more important to, for your single use flags, to get those cleaned out quickly. Because if it's showing something new and you don't want to fall back to the previous thing, yeah, they have some settings for like, okay, should I show the default, uh, should I not show anything or, or return an indeterminate state until I hear back from the server, like what, what are your preferences there. Um, you can, uh, with, with rollout in particular, you can say once this, uh, once this person receives a value, make it like sticky across their different sessions or, or things like that. Uh, yes, uh, some of that. Um, so that way, if, if you've got someone that is uh, using on multiple different devices or platforms even, uh, as long as you provide a, a user identifier um, that is the same across those, that same user will, will get that, the same set of flags. Because they, they let it, <coughs> you, can, you can either specify a user ID or have it generate a user ID for you. Um, and it will use those when doing like A-B testing. So you can say, send this to 5% of the audience and it will remember which bucket you were put into um, as, as a new user. That's right. Yeah. But it does that uh, matching between a real user and like which bucket they were in. Mm -hmm. Do you have to provide it like a user ID or something? Uh, so you either provide it yourself, um, and that will work across different devices if you're logging into the same user account on your phone versus your browser versus your other browser. Um, or you can have the, the service provide a randomized user ID, and that will persist, persist for one, one device. So like you, you log, log in, it generated this random token, and as long as you're using that same browser, you'll continue to get the same configuration. If you logged into the same account on your phone and we're using the random ID, you're going to get a new random ID on your phone and it's not going to, you, you might have a different experience. I feel like some apps are definitely doing that in the Because mm. <laughs> when I'm on my work computer using the same software as my home computer, I want the same experience. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that Rollout does is it has a, a series of sort of built-in uh, metrics that you can use for, or, or not really metrics, but more dimensions for uh, grouping audiences. So like location, time zone, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also specify any number of custom properties. So like if you, uh, you say, I only want this available to admins, um, you can send whether or not that session is an admin as part of the configuration and it will let you change based on that. Yeah, there's so many possible conditions like that that you can, you can come up with. I think our Jacob Flags provides like six out of the box and then a couple more on the application, but we haven't gotten into regions and stuff like that. And I guess maybe there's our audiences in the US, but, but I mean, what kinds of possible ways that we can come up with? On that topic, of course. Sure. Okay. Yeah. On, on the topic of comp, comp, combinations. Oh, and thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Uh, what about automated testing? And is there a notion of fuzzing these feature flags so that you know that the code you're targeting around the flag doesn't change in the presence of others? Anything like that? Right, making sense. I'm not sure if I'm enough of a back-end developer to answer that clearly or to, to know exactly what you mean. But um, we do, I mean, the as far as the conditions themselves, they're all tested in typical Python code. I, you know, I, I can't really answer that very well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. I don't know if I, I'd be curious to talk to you more about it. Yeah, I guess uh, just to or, explain or my not, question. Not, no, yeah. <laughs> Maybe in the case. So, so you gave us a demo, right? But you've got to get a feature flag that there's 52 others out there. Right. right. So is there any notion of enabling all 52 or 48 of them and then running that same thing and getting the same result because oh. they should not impact what you've done? Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I think... I guess the only time I can see that conflicts like that coming into play would be if you have flags nested inside each other. Yeah. At least, I mean, at least in the common do something on a template scenario, maybe if you're using like the thing Google thing, you're using them in other areas of your Python code, I guess then you could definitely get some weird interactions. Do you set up a testing regime that toggles them all the test them? That'd be that'd be a lot to to test. I mean. Yeah, I'm just imagining the Selenium test that's running and it's picking the third div and then it changes. Yeah, no, he he pegged me in it as a back yeah. back end developer, so <laughs> <laughs> Those type of things it wouldn't matter, but you could definitely do some of that for, for the that's, that's a good idea. Those kind of questions? One of the discussions I was hoping to, to have or, or hear about during this is sort of the the implications of this at scale. So like how does this change your, your QA process or your testing process or, or anything? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we, I mean, testing is one of the main ways we use them. We, we want to develop something. Um, I guess the, the beta thing is the simplest example we have. Um, we have a beta testing flag and that flag is on, um, well, I guess generally, generally the way we do it is, is with the template conditions. If, uh, if something is in the beta environment, display it. If not, don't. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of when we need to Sometimes we want to show industry representatives a preview of something uh, before we roll it out publicly. We can put it on the beta site and have them access it there. If we need even more security through obscurity because we don't want somebody stumbling on it, it's a public site, it's not indexed by Google, but somebody can still stumble on it, we can. There's a condition for putting it behind a specific query stream. So we've got to you know, manually add to the URL some query stream to activate the new thing. Um, I don't know if it's getting to your scale question or not, but we, I mean, as you, as you saw, there are 53 some odd flags, many of which are, can be removed at this point probably. Well, actually, I've inventoried them recently, and there's not as many as you might think, maybe a half a dozen or one time use flags that can be pulled out. Scale is a, scale is a challenge for sure.
not sure I'm really answering your question. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, say you're, you're putting a feature out, um, so do you then have QA test both with the flag on and with the flag off, make sure it's good, and then that gets built out, or like? It's kind of the difference between using the flag for testing and testing the flag. Yeah. And we do test the flag, and we build automation around that that we can promote yeah. in the environment. Mm -hmm. And it does add to it, you know, the time sure. it takes to do sure. that, but it, it provides the, you know, that value. And then whenever we deprecate the flag, I mean, we can use those same tests to make sure that everything is working as it's supposed to, and that after you remove that flag, mm -hmm. that feature toggle, that both of those tests get you your same results. Sure. So it's more about, like, you're not writing two tests, you're keeping the old tests, writing new tests, making sure they both pass with the feature flag flipped, and then removing the old test. <laughs> if we had the old test, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we're a whole legacy <laughs> system, and everything's yeah. all new. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've done that. We've had tests for the old thing, tests that are you know, passing with the feature flags on. And, you know, and we have done it with the combinations, but not to scale. I mean, really limited that, you know, those two flags maybe play nicely together. And as far as manual QA, pretty much we're just, we, I mean, before the flag is on, it's typically a known good state, so we just pretty much have somebody turn the flag on locally or on the test environment and have them test with the flag and see if it's covered. Um, something I would like to use more is visual regression testing, and a good thing to do with that would be take snapshots with it on and then use that to, when you remove the flag, make sure the snapshots still match. And the progression is as you decommission the flag. Any regrets? Things you wish you hadn't used feature flags for? Oh, that's a great question. Um, just in case the, the microphone is not picking these questions up from the audience, he asked if we have any regrets, things we might have wished uh, we hadn't used the feature flag. I don't, I mean, I don't think so. Not that it weren't like business decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are things that I don't think are necessary to, to hide for a certain amount of time uh, versus just putting it out there in um, But that's not always our call. Um, but in general, I don't. I don't see any particular drawbacks other than not being necessarily great, as good as we want yet, about getting that tech data out of there once they're all the time.